everybody else is here because you've all played some sort of role in trying to help get this together in some way, shape, or form. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about mindfulness and acceptance approaches in sport, and also some of the other approaches that I propose in sport. But one of the main reasons why I focused on sport is because I think it's a really interesting analogy for life, where you can measure performance in a way that you can't in other ways. Um, you know, Surgery is a performance, public speaking is a performance in the same way that sports are performance. But sometimes in sport we can measure someone's performance down to the millimetre in a way that you can't in a public speech. You know what I mean? Like I will get kind of a score from this, but it's not really that objective in the same way that sport can be. So I think it's a really nice metaphor for um, looking at uh, how we perform in daily life. So if that sort of helps generalise some of the things that are a bit nuanced about golf, we'll try to connect the dots to the rest of us um, today. So for a long time, the main way of improving sport performance was based on a pretty consistent pattern, which for athletes, they tended to perform better when they were confident, when they felt good about themselves, and when they were feeling relaxed. Not too relaxed, but sort of in their, their sort of happy zone. And so there's been lots of meta-analyses um, of correlational studies that have shown this pattern. And so interventions for a long time were focused on trying to aim for these kind of three things. And they were called content-focused approaches because they were trying to change how we felt, right? Try to change our thoughts or change our feelings, basically. And so the, to give you some concrete examples, progressive muscle relaxation was, you know, as an approach of trying to tense and relax your muscles to induce physiological relaxation. And things like motivational self-talk is, you know, changing your thoughts to try to make them more positive. There's literally been DART studies that say instead of saying you can't do it, change it to you can do it. And that's sort of an example of this. And as far as the systematic reviews of these approaches go, things like relaxation haven't been shown to improve people's performance. It helps them relax, but it doesn't necessarily translate into performance benefits. Uh, motivational self-talk, there was one meta-analysis that found a small effect size. Um, but in general, the folk, like approaches that try to build these three things don't often translate into performance benefits. Um, based on the sort of reviews on those topics. So that's not necessarily what's happening there. So there's sort of been a few different approaches that have been shown to improve people's performance quite reliably. So to give you an example of three, these are three separate meta-analyses. Um, instructional self-talk is where instead of trying to build your confidence, it tries to change your attention. So something like watch the ball isn't making you more confident, but saying that to yourself might help you focus your attention on something useful. That's got a very strong effect size, particularly for things like um, fine motor skills like golf and darts and things like that. Goal setting's been shown to improve people's persistence and performance, but again, that's about trying to usually focus someone's attention onto some sort of outcome or a process. Um, trying to either win a race or beat a time or focus on getting to a certain number of sit-ups. All of those are trying to shift your attention somewhere. And mental practice is the idea of internally rehearsing a skill, um, shifting your attention to specific parts of that skill so it becomes more automatic when you execute it on the field. And so all of these aren't really trying to change how, you, how confident you are or try to relax you so much, but most of them are trying to generally shift your attention to somewhere a bit more useful. Um, and so the next approach that I'll be talking about are uh, mindfulness approaches which try to shift people's attention but also while dealing with things like low confidence or, or high anxiety. So the mindfulness and acceptance approaches are best summarised I think by a wise sage who just won Wimbledon, Novak Djokovic, who said, I acknowledge the negative thoughts and let them slide by. This lets me focus on what's really important. <coughs> So it's not trying to change the negative thoughts, it's not trying to relax, it's more trying to acknowledge them and then let them go and then focus on what you're trying to do. Okay, so then using that as a way of helping you shift your attention to other things. So there's lots of different approaches that come under this sort of umbrella, which we're going to call today context-focused approaches. Because they're not trying to change the content of your internal experience, but trying to change the way you relate to them. So some examples, which you, I'm sure most people are familiar with mindfulness meditation, it's not really trying to necessarily change how you feel, it's trying to just become aware of the present moment, non-judgmentally, with acceptance. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy, as you, you might be aware, uses mindfulness but with other things like goal setting or with 
explicit strategies for managing thoughts and feelings. And self-compassion also uses mindfulness, but with an attitude of uh, self-kindness um, and also connecting with like the common humanity of everybody going through similar struggles. But these are all connected through this shift in the way that we change or address how we feel inside. Rather than trying to change it, we're trying to just kind of notice it and um, let it go. But as I started reading about these things and practicing mindfulness, one kind of problem hit me, which was sort of the recommended dose for these interventions. So for something like instructional self-talk, you might only you know, be using that cue for a couple of seconds at a time throughout a training session as you, talk, you practice and focus in your attention on something. But something like a brief mindfulness um, program will still include something like 10 minutes a day. That's considered brief. Mindfulness-based stress reduction recommends, I think, 30 to 45 minutes a day of sitting deliberate practice of being in the moment. And when you add that up over a week, it ends up like being a lot of time that you're investing in developing this skill. And I think, you know, all of us have busy schedules and athletes are the same. We want to know whether that time was well spent and whether that is a really effective use of, of time compared with the opportunity cost that might could be put into other interventions like mental practice or physical practice. So, there were three processes to trying to figure that out, that we looked at. One was to do a systematic review of all of the context-focused approaches in athletes to see what the effects are that have been shown so far. The second was to do a randomised controlled trial to see in a uh, brief design whether we can influence people's performance with the mindfulness approach. And the third was to try to make it easier for people to look at the causal model underlying these approaches over time, which I'll explain. So let's just start with the, the systematic review first. Um, so we, we screened about 5,000 records, and we ended up finding over 66 studies to put into a, a qualitative synthesis. We couldn't do a meta-analysis because there were so many different combinations of outcomes and interventions and participants that it wouldn't really make sense to pull them together. It would have been like bringing apples with potatoes rather than pulling apples and apples together. Okay? So we, we didn't do that, but we ended up with quite a number of studies that have looked at these approaches in sport. We were quite surprised to find over 60 studies that have looked And the good news is that of the three sort of approaches and, and a few other types of meditation which all operate by the same kind of processes, there were quite consistent findings that it increased people's present moment awareness, so their ability to focus on the moment. Also their ability to get lost in the moment, to sort of feel that experience of flow. And most people sort of know the idea of just being so absorbed in your work that when the time flies by, the same thing happens with athletes, and that tends to increase for people after they receive mindfulness intervention. There were um, consistent positive findings and associations with performance, and there was paradoxically a reduced anxiety, right? Because it's not trying to reduce your anxiety, but the way that you know, ACT will interpret it is that it's sort of like exhaust from the engine. When you're focused on the moment, you're less focused on your nerves, and so it tends to get less caught up in it, it creates less of a um, bad spiral. So even though you're not trying to target anxiety, often that comes off as a sort of added benefit. Some interesting preliminary findings is that people were increasing their confidence. There was even one study that found reduced injuries um, and a reduced chance of, of burnout. That's what kind of they were stay motivated for longer. The bad news from that review is that we couldn't find any studies that met the Cochrane risk of bias criteria for a low risk study. So some of those criteria are things like transparent, transparent reporting of like how they randomised people making sure that was concealed, um, blinding the people who were measuring the outcome, because a lot of the time it was the same researcher delivering the intervention and then measuring the outcome, you know what I mean? And it's sometimes easier to round up or down if you're the person who's sort of invested in the hypothesis. Um, when there was missing data, they often didn't manage it using anything like a sensitivity analysis. Um, and very few out of find any that had registered their, their protocol in advance or have anything that we could kind of track to make sure they hadn't selectively reported outcomes, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the bad news is that of all of those kind of positive findings, we couldn't find any that were considered sort of low risk. So some people, when we put this in for submission, thought that maybe that's just too hard in sport. 
it's just um, too difficult to do a high quality study when you've only got a small percentage of the population who are athletes who might be eligible, and I mean a small percent of them are willing to go in a study where they're going to get randomised to a placebo, for example. Um, but some of the things we argue sort of weren't too hard. So to increase the internal validity of studies, as I'm sure some of you are aware, you can just use a consort checklist to make sure you report everything. Um, and so that's free, it doesn't cost anything, it just requires a bit of a culture change. And in the same way, pre-registering your protocol, your analyses, what's your primary outcome going to be, that's, that's free as well. Again, it just requires a bit of a culture change. And to talk about why this is important, um, as I was going through my PhD, there was the um, replication crisis in psychology, and they often refer to pre-registration as one of the best ways of preventing that problem. And here's uh, some of the, the reasons why. So, this is the rates of significant findings before pre-registration standards happen, okay? So you can see, this is from the, um, all of the grants from, I think, the National Heart and Lung Institute in the US. About 55% of their findings were significant before the year 2000. What do you think that number drops to after they start making people pre-register their studies? 10, have a chat to the person next to you, have a bet, give, some, give them a number. Okay. So, who, who, hands up if you thought it was between, say, 20 or above? Over 28? Who thought it between 10 and 20 percent? And who thought it, who thinks it's less than 10? You guys are right on. It drops to 5%. So once they started mandating that people registered their protocols, all of a sudden 95% of grants were not significant. Um, let's look at mindfulness studies that have had their protocols registered. Okay. What percentage of registered mindfulness studies were published after two and a half years? after they'd said that they'd finished data collection, right? So they said they finished data collection, what percentage of them actually got published within a two and a half year period, which is a pretty reasonable time period. Okay, and have a bet with the person next to you. Okay, so remember that these studies had to be big enough for them to bother to register a protocol already. So they probably had some grant funding, you know what I mean? You don't kind of register, you know, little itty bitty studies. I did, yeah. 62% 60, of the mindfulness studies didn't get published within two and a half years, which means, like, like perhaps the, the argument in this study was that they were getting file drawn, right? That they weren't getting published because maybe the results weren't that favourable, okay? I think also in that study, they didn't find a single one of them that had clearly defined a single primary outcome, right? They say, oh, we will look at well-being, but then they might report whichever well-being one happened to be significant. Uh, I supervised a PhD thesis that looked, it, it did a meta-analysis of studies that had a PhD thesis followed by a publication. And this issue of picking and choosing, so the number of dependent variables that were listed in the PhD uh, thesis were huge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and only the significant ones were reported in the publication. Right, yeah. yeah. And it's, so this is a major issue, right? And especially with things like performance, where like in, you know, there might be five ways of measuring someone's performance, and then they could report just the one that tends to come up. Or if you measure all these outcomes, maybe they're just reporting the significant ones. Um, if we have a look at sports psychology, this is the last one of my, my questions. What percentage, so they looked at 11 journals across seven years, how many sports psychology studies were pre-registered? Go Sports Psych, we're sort of the leader in performance. What percentage of sports psychology had any sort of pre-registration? Let's see. So there wasn't a single one, that, and like I mean that's partially because the bar's lifted right in the last ten 
like the people, this is sort of more of a standard now than it was before. Um, but look, we, I'm, I'm sort of talking about this a little bit because I think it's really important that, like, because internal validity was a big part of the kind of key components. <coughs> um, and so we did the first, as far as we're aware. First of all, one, the prospectively registered randomized um, files. Not quite under a good thing. We were, and then, then another, something changed. Anyway, so what we did is we got a group of golfers, and the reason we chose golf was because Chris plays golf. <laughs> <laughs> the reason we chose golf is because it's it's probably the best sport for objectively measuring performance down to the nearest millimeter. Like if a rugby league player gets one percent better, it's really hard to tell because there's just chaos on the field. Right? Or if a football team's one percent better, it's really hard. Whereas with golf, you can pretty objectively measure their performance on a lot of on a lot of teams. So that's why I chose that. And we randomly allocated them to either do a brief mindfulness intervention that was less than 10 minutes, um, or do spend this, exactly the same amount of time just watching the ABC. Um, they, watched, they watched a golf documentary, so we thought it would be interesting to golfers, um, and we thought that would just be a nice attention or control. And then we swapped them over to see if the mindfulness followed up for another 10 or 20 minutes later, and to see whether the ABC group got a sort of a bit of a kick um, after switching to the mindfulness group. And then we, we measured them on a few things. We measured their performance by asking them to put at some targets, and we used a, a camera to measure exactly how far away they were from each of those targets. Then we measured their biomechanics using a, a SAM PUT lab, which basically measures everything from, it, I think it's about 200 frames a second, it's measuring their angle of attack, so right at the point of impact, it'll tell you exactly how they're aiming, how they're rotating, check their timing, all that sort of stuff. And we asked them questions about their levels of anxiety and their levels of um, mindfulness as well, to see if those were kind of mediating as we expected. So, we thought this was low risk of glass because it was randomised all by Qualtrics. Um, the person in the room didn't know what they'd been randomised by because they just did it on the, the iPad. Um, it was blinded because they weren't aware of the hypotheses, they just thought we were looking at the effect of pressure on their performance. Um, the outcome measurement was blinded, we pre-registered it, because it was a single session, we didn't really get any people who dropped out. Um, so we think it's a low risk of bias study as well. Okay. What did we find? Um, of those three things, we didn't find any benefits for performance, we didn't find it changed their levels of anxiety, it didn't even change their mindfulness. Um, which is a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, it did have a little influence on their, a 1% influence on their biomechanics, which I'll explain in a second. Um, so the orange line is what happens when they received mindfulness, and the blue line was when they just watched the ABC. And this is a score out of 100, about where 100 is like perfectly consistent putts for 10 shots. No one gets 100, but you can see there's about a 1% increase for the people who get mindfulness and about a 1% decrease when they're enrolled in this competition. Okay? And that's kind of what we were expecting for everything. Um, <laughs> but we didn't find that for performance. Those are some beautifully parallel lines. Um, we didn't find it for competitive anxiety. And as we can see here, mindfulness didn't get influence either. Um, so that's their state mindfulness as well, which we were hoping would change. So we didn't find that, and if we, when we broke down that sand putt lab into three components, it was mostly for the, basically their aim, that they were better at being square to the target, they were more likely to, be, um, to have good aim. Their timing and their consistency didn't change. Um, and when we looked at their anxiety, they actually reported higher levels of anxiety after mindfulness. Um, and the way that we interpreted the bottom part was that when you do mindfulness, you often do, we did an acceptance component too, saying it's normal to feel a bit nervous in a competition, you know, it's a normal part of being an athlete, that's okay. And so they're either, as a result, potentially reporting higher level of anxiety, or they're just more likely to notice it and accept it when they're just sitting with their breath, rather than being distracted by something else. So that's possible too. But, as far as our primary outcome goes, which is performance, we found that, you know, mindfulness was just about as good as as the ABC. So it could be that the mindfulness dose wasn't enough. As as you saw, sort of like mindfulness-based stress reduction is recommending like 35 to 45 minutes a day for up to eight weeks. So that's a big dose, and we gave them a 10 minute 
and that maybe that wasn't enough. And maybe because it was so small, we had to pick a part of the intervention that wasn't super effective. We used some seminal texts to kind of come up with what we thought was the best intervention. Um, but maybe we just picked the, bad, the path that weren't the most appropriate for those, for those athletes. Um, it could just be that mindfulness isn't a panacea, that it helps us with managing <coughs> internal experiences. But for something like sport, which is intrinsically goal-oriented, maybe mindfulness, which is supposed to be sort of non-goal-oriented, isn't a great fit. Um, and it could have also been that there was a fairly intrusive measurement in a sense that they were they had a, a clip attached to their putter and they were standing within a meter of this 30 kilo apparatus um, and it could have been the fact that you're just right there under intense scrutiny the whole time that it's really hard to sort of potentially be in the moment like that it could be that there weren't any expectancy effects because everything was double blinded that they weren't sort of they just thought that they were watching ABC and it was just trying to get them in the moment, you know, and they thought that that was supposed to be good. And when you do mindfulness, maybe that gives you the same expectancy effect. Um, or it could just be that the ABC is just amazing. <laughs> um, and so when we like tried to do a longer mindfulness study, we would pair it up with um, the Movember Foundation who were doing a, a thing with athletes that was going to last a year. And one of the barriers that got in the way of us doing that was that they were already giving about 80 items of questionnaires to um, these athletes who didn't have much of an incentive to participate. And so for one, they wanted a sort of more established intervention of mindfulness, but two, they actually said they didn't have enough time to squeeze in the mindfulness measure into that battery. Because the you know shortest measure that we could find for athletes was 15 items, and that on top of 80 for teenagers became a bit of a thing that stopped them from stopped us from integrating mindfulness into that study. So the other thing that um, led us to this final sort of study was to, you know, randomised, as Phil has taught me a hundred times, randomised trials aren't the only way of determining causality, right? Otherwise we'd all be smoking because we haven't been randomised into, you know, no one's been able to do that. One way of doing it is trying to assess the causal model that's going on underneath there, assessing whether mindfulness is a mediator of interventions towards an outcome. Um, and so, like I was saying, we tried to um, put this into a longitudinal study, but these are the lengths of the most common mindfulness questionnaires. Um, the only one for sport is the mindfulness inventory for sport, and that's 15 items, which doesn't seem like very much for, for three scales, but we thought it would make it easier for people in the future to integrate this sort of measurement if it was, if it was shorter. So what we did is we tried to take that item and make it um, as short as possible and see what the trade-offs were for reliability and validity. We got an, almost a thousand um, undergraduate students doing sports science, so all of them were participating in sport at some level, about 20% were elite, about 10% you know, um, did a little bit of physical activity, but most of them were sort of either you know, competitively engaged in some kind of sport. And then we had the golfers from before who had already done that questionnaire. We gave the undergraduates the questionnaire at the start of a semester and then about three months later um, so that we could do test retest reliability. And for the golfers, we gave them the questionnaire and then we looked at their um, performance on that test, but also their performance over the long term because we had their handicap, which is their you know, measure of their performance over their whole career. What's yours in the moment, Chris? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> we randomly took a sample of these and set them aside because we're using, we used a machine learning algorithm for the 75% block and didn't want to overfit it to that group. So we split this group in half and made a short questionnaire using this group and then tested how good it was using the, the other 25%. Um, and so to do that, we used a genetic algorithm, which I know, I know quite a few people are familiar with, thanks to Keith and Belchinder. Um, but to give you sort of the long and the short, it, it creates, ah, excuse the pun, um, it creates a, a short measure from the long measure, right? And it randomly creates lots of short measures from the long measure, and then it competes them against each other to see which is the best at explaining the variance in the long measure. Okay. And then it gets the best ones, and crosses over the items, mutates them, creates little child questionnaires, and then it does it again. And it repeats this process over and over until you end up with a short measure that ex best explains the variance in the, the whole long measure. Okay? 
So it does that and it creates another group and another group and it does that about 200 times. Is it chill children you produce with each other? Yeah, it's, it's a bit like Queensland. <laughs> oh, sorry, you know, it's my music. Um, <laughs> oh, anyway, what we found is that um, as the measures got shorter, the, re the internal consistency got a little bit worse, but that's to be expected because one of the numbers in there is um, the length of the, the measure. But you can see for most of the short measures, they're still acceptable. Like acceptable is above 0.7 usually, sort of the rough rule of thumb. Um, and so overall, even the short measures are still reasonably internally consistent in the samples that we looked at. What was really uh, positive is that the full scale, the correlations between the short measure and the full measure, um, is really high. Particularly as soon as you start using um, like three or four items or even two items, the correlations are still like 0.9. So you're almost getting all of the variance in the full measure when you just use even two items for each of the, the subscale. Um, we looked at criterion validity and you can see the correlations here aren't very high. So these are measures of self-report mindfulness. Um, and so even though these, the measures of mindfulness in sport don't correlate highly with measures of mindfulness generally. And that could be because the way that people shift their attention in sport is different. I mean, this is potentially one argument for using a sport-specific measure because the way that we feel or report might be different. Um, but the good news was that, again, the, it wasn't like the short measures got worse correlations than the long measures, but they were all reasonably consistent on criterion validity there, and it was the same with the performance or the behavioural <coughs> performance. So, um, if we look at someone's handicap, this was the athlete's ability to refocus, and it's a good sign that the more um, they could refocus, the better their handicap. So it's like the less they got distracted over time. But it's also showing that a couple of the indicators weren't good predictors there either. So anyway, that's interesting. Um, with the factorial validity, they were at least acceptable for all of them. The, the, you can see the fit indices tend to actually be better for the shorter measures. Um, so, but they, the fact of fit was the same regardless of the measure length. So it, wasn't, it didn't seem to ruin the factor structure at all. Okay. Um, and so there's a couple of options that we hope to be able to give other researchers. Is they could use the full 15 item measure, um, or if they use the one that's 9 items, they still get acceptable internal consistency in all the samples that we tested. There wasn't any loss to criterion validity and the fact of fit was still really good. Um, if you even just use two items for each of the subscales, so a really short six item measure, the internal consistency drops off, but there wasn't any loss in any of the validity measures, including the, the fact of fit worked really well. Um, so we hope that with a short measure like that, it makes it easier for people to do long term randomised trials and measure people for mindfulness across time without the questionnaire burden being a barrier to assessing that. Um, and even in non-randomised trials, assessing the mediators of action to see whether it is changes in mindfulness that are explaining changes in performance or whether it's something else. Um, and it, regardless of the design, based on some of the findings, we do hope that people start to do more blinding, better management of missing data um, and registering a protocol. Until then, um, I just wanted to leave you guys with one exercise, just because you know I like experimental exercise, that has been proven to um, reduce your anxiety. Um, so hopefully you guys will find this relaxing. Hi, I'm Adam Scott. Okay. Oh. <laughs> You need to have a talk about your Queensland coming <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what were your two items for your questionnaire, your mindfulness questionnaire? So there were two items for each of the subscales. But the, for example, the awareness one was um, like I'm aware of my thoughts and feelings, um, which is you know, pretty encompassing of the whole construct. Um, and 
So I've got, I've got the, in the publication we've got, so here's the two items that we'd recommend if you're going to use those two. And the genetic algorithm just tries to find, not two that look at exactly the same thing, but two that explain the variance and the formation. So it's two quite different items. I thought the, when you drop the reliability, the criterion correlations have to go down. It's in the formula, but in this instance, they don't seem to be. And I, I, mean, I found that interesting. Uh, I don't, it's not necessarily a question, but it is, yeah. it is awesome that it's still predicting the criterion. Like, almost who cares about internal consistency? Mm -hmm. It's the same criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could be because some of the questionnaire items are really wordy. Um, okay. And it could be that eliminating them is eliminating some noise rather than actually assessing the, the But theoretically, the number of items increases reliability and reliability which relate to the strength of the correlation. So, yeah. That's a good point. She needs a latent correlation as well. Are you getting correlations from the structural equation or scale scores? Just scale scores. I just said game one. Somebody's going to ask a hard question. I have already left. I'm going to have a hard question. You got the hard question. Come on. <laughs> Have you considered using E7 for now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so well, we should we should just say, Mike, uh, you've been an academic and a PhD student with us, and you're leaving really soon. And so, I think we should say a big thank you to the contribution you've made to the institute, and we'll uh, certainly miss you. Aww. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why he's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After the Queensland Cup, I thought they were. Okay, Andrew Perry is another round back session presented by Herb outside. So.